Good morning and thank you for joining us. I'm Alero Edu and this, this is Sunrise. Good morning. I'm Neil Taigbe and welcome to the show, uh, which, is, which happens to be the first in the month of August. Yes, that's true. Second. Hmm? Last week was the first of where's August. My, where are my numbers? <laughs> This is the second Saturday. Today is the 8th of August, and it's the birthday mm. of my man, Roger Federer. He's 39 today. It also happens to be my but daughter's birthday. Your daughter's birthday. birthday, yes. And she's eight years today. And she says eight to me... Eight on the eighth day mm -hmm. of the eighth month. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's gone on and on. Daddy is a special one. Eight on the eighth eight day of, of the, the eighth, eighth month. month. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Roger Federer. Happy birthday, KU. That's my daughter's name. Happy birthday to all those running their birthdays today. It's especially a good day, Alera. In spite of all that there is, Lagos has been... This week has been like that in terms of movement. Oh. But fortunately... Well, are you surprised? Hmm. No, I'm kind of surprised because <laughs> where the traffic situation now is... Is where there's never traffic. Oh, well, let, let's say it's a tail back from a, the bridge. Well, for, you know the funny thing? The third mainland bridge is not even as choked as, is, as it used to be. That's what I no, hear. I it looks like everybody, happened. those who actually use it say, they, when they get on it, they ask, so where is everybody? It looks exactly. like everybody's just giving it wide berth. Just don't go there because the traffic is going to be so mad. And then on the other side, on the other road, the alternative road, mm. I happened to have gone on one of them um, yes, yesterday, day before yesterday and yesterday, because I went to uh, do a story on the island. But guess what? Yes, choking, mm -hmm. but moving. How about snail speed or slower than snail speed? Which was well, that? at least you're moving. <laughs> no, but the annoying <laughs> bit is, is the, the same thing we keep talking about, the mm. shunting. Yeah, the shunting. And then those who come in oh. with this, with these sirens, as in they're the big, big men, they're oh, all... Yeah, well, yeah, well. I mean, well, Lagos State has a law that says no sirens except you're an ambulance. But no. Hello, I here? remember interviewing Professor Soludo the other day, you know, many years ago, when he was going for, I think it was governorship or whatever he was going for at the time. And I said, um, what exasperates us is that when you all want our votes, you come, pro I mean, practically kneeling on your knees to beg for the votes. And the moment you get there, you run the sirens you and drive us off the road. Drive us off the road because you want to get past. I mean, we are the ones who put you there. Join the queue and join the traffic. So you'll see what we are experiencing so that you know how to fix it. I appreciate one man, and I'll call his name. He was governor of Lagos State, Obatunde Fashala. He comes in traffic and he stays there. At least I've experienced him once. I don't know about you. I've seen him once <laughs> behind me. I have and seen him too. He stays there. Until no siren. You I don't even like, know that he's the one. What's going on? <laughs> you don't even know that he's the one. So now that Lagos is um, repairing roads and fixing, or the federal government's fixing bridges, Lagos repairing roads like the Ojota area, blocked off and all of that, we still need to practice driving for you and driving for the other person. Because Ogudu Road... Hmm has now become the alternative route for those coming from Ojota, connecting third mainland, or vice versa, whichever yeah. the case may be. Yeah. It's like, it's a madhouse. Then all the kekers that ply the inner roads oh are all jumping in and all of that. Please, let's not talk about those. <sighs> um, and by the way, the first Saturday mm. of the third mainland bridge thing, after I left the studio, I was able to go on Third Mainland Bridge. I was uh, diverted off at Ibutemeta into Yaba, told to make a U-turn and climb the bridge again and go all the way on Third Mainland Bridge. Mm -hmm. But last weekend, I was diverted off the Third Mainland Bridge at Ibutemeta, and I was not allowed back onto the bridge. So I'm asking again, at what time does the bridge shut? Okay, so... The law enforcement people have to be absolutely sure of the information that they're giving out. So the people don't say, but it happened last week. Mm. 
and then they try and do the same thing and you're diverting them to all kinds of areas, maybe the areas they haven't even been to before. Please, let, let's be clear about the information that we are, you, you are giving us to give to people. Okay. Um, well, the initial information says at 12 noon, the bridge shuts for those going to the island. The and commissioner of police was here on that first yes. day and said one o'clock. Okay. And I was able to use the bridge. At 1 o'clock. Up, up, well, after 12, 12.30, because I left the studio at 12. Okay. So I was able to use the bridge after 12 o'clock. So at 1 o'clock, it's those coming back to the mainland that are allowed to uh, use It the seems bridge. like it is 12 o'clock, not 1. <laughs> anyway, we, we, you know we promised that we're going to bring them back one of these days to come yes. and talk to us again and see what's yeah, update, been happening. That's yeah, right. To update us what's happening. I know that's that within right. the week, the road safety corps marshal visited the bridge. Um, the Minister of Works visited the bridge as well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. also to see what's happening and all that. And passing there, you actually see that they are working, I think they are working real hard to see how quickly, so it might get ready before the six months they talked about. If they go at the pace there. I going. say a big amen to that, because Lagos is a mess without that mainland bridge. It I seems know. to be, it's, it is the major, major artery to move around in it's, this it, town. It's, it's this tight because, you know, they're also working on the other bridges, yes. the Carter Bridge. Why must they work so, on all of them at the same time? Because, as I said, things were not done when they were supposed to have been done as uh. time was going on and all. So right now it's like, okay, let's get it all done almost at once. So everyone, patience. Oh, yeah, patience. the tanker thing of yesterday. Um, our hearts go out to the woman who was um, killed in that... Uh, nasty thing that we heard about. If uh, Mr. Kwaifa sent me a message about it. And um, because of that, <clears throat> uh, you have heard that Nupeng is calling the people out, you know, from Monday. Why are they calling their people out? But they said Lagos State is not doing what it should be doing to protect them. To protect them or to protect the people on the road? Uh, them. Okay. Um, and I, I remember clearly one of the things that they complained about was uh, extortion by law enforcement when they would come into Lagos State. Mm. I it's here at the end of the day, Leo. This this thing about you know when we talk about corruption, someone once said that it's a hydra-headed monster. It is. It's not just at the government at the top level. Is that every level. The gate and man asked, to let you in wants you to grease his palm. He will tell you it will cost you. Thank <laughs> you. Because what is the gate man <laughs> seeing? He's seeing your ostentatious lifestyle and feels like, ah, if this person can do it, why can't I do it? Be. Or you tell a group of security operatives to block the road curfew. But their welfare, they don't know about their welfare. They are, not, they are concerned about what will happen to them by the time, if something happens to them and they pass, what will happen to their family. They are also con so they are thinking about that and they are looking for how to make up for that. How to prepare for the so, eventuality. So if the same way that some public office holders expect that when they finish, they'll get some kind of pension or servant's pay, uh -huh. they know the amount that they are going to get by the time they are leaving office, what if these guys who are putting their lives on the line are also made aware of what's going to come to them by the time they are done serving? Or peradventure, God forbid anything happens to them, their family will be taken. What if they know for sure that this is what it is? That their family will not be running around looking for how would it happen? And then they tell you that uh, fuel price uh, in Nigeria is the cheapest in the world, blah, 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 I understand blah. it's going to... Yeah, but uh, you forget that in other climes, uh, the citizens don't have to worry about, um, okay, should I die on the road being a policeman? What's going to happen to my family? Because the government has made sure that his family gets taken care of for the rest of their lives. You know, well, those, I mean, if I don't get a job, uh, what happens to me? Well, there's somewhere where you go to, to collect, say, small amount of money which will Tides keep you, you till the next day you know all those don't exist in my country and yet we're comparing ourselves to other people 
all the time. Alero. People are hungry in Nigeria, and COVID-19 has come and made all that even worse. And then a minister tells us that every single Nigerian received palliatives. Palliatives from where? I'm sitting here. I didn't get nothing. He didn't get nothing. So who are these people that she gave them to? Okay. They said, um, she, hello? She actually clarified that it's not everybody. Oh, she clarified. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry, I missed that part of the story. <laughs> okay, so what's the clarification? Uh, well, I, I will get you those details exactly when we get... But then Thank she you. clarified on Thursday that it's not everybody, but oh. at least the poorest of the poor. Another case of, oh, um, after saying it, they come back and say, I didn't say it. Um, <clears throat> Let's see what we have on the there's menu. There's television today. and there's radio, and you can record and play back as many times as you want. So you did say so. You did say so. Uh, no, I didn't say so. Well, <clears throat> Akbabio said so. Please, off your mic. Okay. Uh, but we have to do the menu. Uh, we're looking at a uh, state of security in Nigeria. First. Then we're looking at COVID-19, schools and religious centers opening. That is a shout. Idumuje Uboko, a community under threat of insecurity. And then we shall close with the Artist of the Week segment, as is usual on Sunrise. So make yourself... And... Um, He's a he. he. Yeah, he's a he. Okay. So make yourself comfortable and um, we will take a moment and we will be back. Our Twitter handles will be on the screen. Tweet, send a mail, we'll share with the rest of the world. We'll be back in a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. And now let's get the show on the road. In 2019, the World Economic Forum noted that the Nigerian government must tackle five security challenges, Boko Haram, farmer herders crisis, the Islamic movement of Africa, Niger Delta, and Cameroon. These insecurity challenges, the forum advised, must be dealt with before Nigeria can achieve its true potential. Meanwhile, amidst what the U.S. government described as the worsening security situation across Nigeria, it has advised its citizens not to travel to many states in Nigeria for security reasons. These reasons include terrorism, kidnapping, civil unrest, and maritime crime. So what does all that mean in concrete terms? Well, we have experts with us this morning who are going to break all that down for us. It's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Onyekachi Adekoya, who is a security consultant. Thank you. Thank well. you very much Good for morning. joining us this morning. And joining us from our studios in Abuja, it's my pleasure to welcome a former DSS director, Mr. Mike Ejiofo. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Thanks for joining us this morning. Let me start with you, Mr. Adekoya. So what do you make of this advice that the U.S. is giving its citizens? Does it, does it have any merit? Um, well, I was, a bit, I was a bit surprised at the advice, um, knowing that um, the American state had um, um, taken now what you call the American first approach. So my first um, thinking was, um, why are they putting out the advice now? Be that as it may, America has a responsibility to its own citizens. So it's, it's part of the standard advisory they put out from time to time. Yeah. And it's not really news that um, the unrest in the Maghreb, uh, just above the, what you call the Sahel region, yeah. uh, is beginning to affect um, the Northwest and it's part of the problems you're having in the Northeast. And particularly when you look at the instability in Mali, uh, and some analysts have also posited that um, if care is not taken, um, Mali is not really far from 
uh, the Northwest and the issues happening there may begin to spill over. So I think that's what the American government is talking about. Oh. Uh, so that's not news to us at all. It may be news to some people, but it's not news. So yeah, of, of a truth, there are issues there yeah. and the issues are beginning to uh, morph into something serious, which is why you are beginning to see a number of military operations going into the Northwest. Okay. Now, we are Nigerians. We live here. We yes. don't have any other place to run to. Now, are we tackling these security issues like we should? We heard in the course of the, at the beginning of uh, the week um, calls again for the security chiefs to be fired, and they actually had a meeting with the president. Where is all that getting us? Where are we headed? I think that we must first understand the complexities of the problems that we have. We are facing a hydra-headed um, um, insurgency in the northeast, which has now morphed and moved over to the northwest, and we're beginning to see some incursions into the north central. Um, the talk about service chiefs is neither here nor there. We have the commander in chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. And um, so maybe discussions need to tilt a bit towards the CEC. Um, remember also that the service chiefs are just appointees of the president. You know, and um, when I saw the, the statement from the National Assembly, you know, I think they fell a, a bit short of the mark of where their address should really be going to. Okay, so asking the service chiefs to be replaced, it doesn't really mean anything. On ground, there are real issues. There are issues of shortage of personnel, paucity of equipment. Nigeria is a very big country. The topography of certain parts of the country, you know when we talk about security, we talk about spaces and places. We, we sometimes sitting down in the comforts of our room don't understand the challenges that the military is facing on ground. You know, so I, if we begin to talk about the issues on ground, uh, the service chiefs are, are not really at the heart of the things we should be addressing. The questions I love to ask every time is, number one, we have several battalions operating in the northeast and some in the northwest. Do they have the equipment that they require? to prosecute this war? Question number one. Question number two, do they have the intelligence or what you call local intelligence that they need to aid in their preparation and response to some of these issues? Um, someone just rightly said that uh, the military 80% of the time is flying blind in the north generally because of the issue of, of um, intelligence. Speculation. Not speculation, and I'll give you an or instance. Or allegation. So it's not, OK, look at it this way. The military is going to operate in some remote village somewhere. They've been called out that these insurgents are about to attack a certain location. On their way to respond, they get ambushed. So let me paint this picture for you. Take for coincidence? Instance, not coincidence. Most times, again, they check. Sometimes they also check. Uh, sometimes they have double agents, even people giving them information themselves. It's a difficult terrain. And sometimes these insurgents understand the terrain better than the military coming in. Mm. So they know you have to come at them with vehicles, at least your light attack vehicles. They know. They go and set up camp in places that makes a nonsense of your own equipment. So if you are coming in to meet them, you will be challenged meeting them, and they meet you at the intersection where they have the higher ground, and they fire at you. Just last week, we lost about three, um, I think 13 soldiers, three officers, and that's exactly what has happened. So intelligence is very important. What is the DSS doing to aid the military? What is the NIA doing to aid the military? The military has a directorate of military intelligence, and sometimes they are having to source intelligence themselves. They are challenged because sometimes also the communities don't know who to side with. Whether to side yeah. with the government or to side with the insurgents, oh. they side with the government. Does the government have the capacity to really protect them? Oh. There are a lot of ungoverned spaces in that area. And people have life altering decisions to make every day, oh. whether to side with the government or to side with the insurgents. More importantly, the people who we call insurgents are from these local communities. Nyota, for example, if you come from Ikeja, 
And you know the military is coming to attack in Ikeja. And for some reason, your distant relative or somebody you know is among the insurgents. For example, I'm just saying, let's situate this in the case of the Northeast. If you see the military coming, will you alert that your distant relative from your mother's side or your father's side to the fact that the military is coming or not? No, I won't. If it's no, no, that's, that's if it's you. Okay. But you see, these are people's children, their people's cousins, relatives, and the rest. So the military is also challenged with the fact that there's positive human intelligence. <laughs> so most times on those patrols, they are also having to go blind. Okay. Ask any military person. All right. Mr. Jeffo, um, I do know that one of those times you, you came on one of our shows, you talked about interagency relations. Now, from what um, Mr. Inkachi has talked about here, he's talked about how this um, question of issues on ground, personnel, equipment, but he's centered on information, intelligence, and how it's, I see that's a major, major challenge before you even talk about equipment and personnel. Do you agree with him? To some extent, um, I want to commend uh, Onye Kachide for his submissions. Um, but also, it goes beyond that. I will tell you right away that, um, yes, intelligence drives all operations. And uh, like the alert given by, the, by General Anderson, uh, you see, it's nothing new, just like Onyekasi, Onyekachi has said. It's nothing special about it. If you recall that the State Security Service and the National Intelligence Agency some time ago alerted Nigerians of infiltration of foreigners, especially from the Maghreb, you know, following the, because these insurgents were losing ground in uh, Syria and uh, Lebanon. Or the, so the tendency for them to be coming down to uh, Nigeria with Mali, they're not coming direct to Nigeria. All the countries there uh, in the sub-region are affected. It's not only Nigeria. And you also recall that, uh, like he also said, intelligence, I said, drive all, drives all operations. And when the state security gives intelligence, Onye Kachi has also pointed it out. At times, our military go blind despite the intelligence given. So it becomes a challenge. Now, if you look at the region, there are problems between the various groups, the insurgent groups, the ISWAP, the Boko Haram, the ISIS, and the look. They are all struggling for space and leadership, which the State Security Service has been able to establish. But the problem is, my challenge with uh, the American raising an uh, alarm on this issue is that um, if you begin to give us such information, it, gi it creates panic and apprehension among the populace. So it's not as if the, the agencies are not aware of this, but they try to manage it at their own level so that it don't create uh, apprehension. I, 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 one of the, the regrets I had I had, you know, in service, all this, that the state, in my 35 years, it just of recent, from 2015 or 2010, that the secret service, that is the state security service, now gives information on what they do. It's an agency that thrives just in secrecy. They don't tell you what they do. But if I tell you, the number of uh, uh, assaults that have been foiled or what and what has been uh, brought to check, Nigerians might, not, might, might be wondering, if you give that to this to the uh, public space, there will be problems. So I'm not in line with uh, what uh, America has, has done. But we also remember that uh, while he was addressing, General Anderson was addressing, he established the relationship, the agency relationship uh, between the agencies, the security agencies, uh, the intelligence agencies, and also 
the exchange of intelligence between America and Nigeria. So to that extent, I believe that um, there, is, there are problems on ground, but they are not surmountable. You, you talked about uh, the change of uh, service chiefs. I, I have maintained that the only person who is in position to change the service chief is commander-in-chief. Maybe he has information we don't have. But to the general public, these people are not, they have done their best according to the president, but their best is not good enough. So what do we do to come out of this quagmire? I believe that even if you change the service chiefs, there's two schools of thoughts. Even if you change the service chiefs now, under the present operating circumstance and environment, there's not going to be any change. Our military and security services are ill-equipped, they're under-equipped, they're understaffed, just like any other uh, sector of our polity. You talk of economy, is with this pandemic also coming in. It becomes a problem, but we have to move forward. Therefore, we need this, when you say the, the Nigerians, Mr. we need the support of Nigerians. Mr. Therefore, you, this picture, both of you have painted a bleak picture. But I know that Nigerians yeah. and indeed the rest of Africa and the world that are watching will be looking to say, because a lot of people have said it, if Nigeria is not at peace, <laughs> Africa will be very, very unstable. So what do we do? How do we move forward to get all of this sorted? Short, um, short, short handed, no, not enough personnel, not enough equipment, intelligence sharing, interagency relations. The president's given that directive, re-strategize or rework their security architecture in the entire country. Is that a pointer to maybe something like state police or a, a, a breakdown of the structure so that it's easier to manage? You see, like uh, the president said, that they should go and re-strategize. I don't know who is going to re-strategize. Is it the NSC or these various agencies to re-strategize? We have had a lot of stories on changing of tactics and uh, strategies, and yet results are not results on ground, are not commensurate to what the, to the challenges we have. So it's a it's a, a, a big problem, and uh, if you look at the issue of um, Take, for instance, everybody is worried. Nigerians are worried. Like you said, Nigeria, if there's any major political security problem in Nigeria, the West African sub-region, not only the West African sub-region, the whole continent, the world will be affected because of Nigeria's strategic position. And that is why it's important that we are collaborating. This terrorism is a global war. It cannot be fought by one country. So we are collaborating with other uh, countries and trying to find solutions in terms of support. America, for instance, has been of assistance providing uh, aircrafts. Uh, we, they, they, we are purchasing uh, aircraft like the Tucano aircraft. But these things take a lot of time before they arrive. They are not things you buy off the shelf. My problem now is that we must look for local solutions to our problems. And this includes restructuring not just the country, but the security agencies and apparatus. For instance, you talk about state police. The only one of the major solutions to our problem is decentralization of the, 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 the security agencies, the police in particular. Because, like uh, Onyekachi said, you see people finding problems, whether to take side with government or take side with the terrorists. If we have this problem that you have people who are very conversant with their localities, the confidence there for the security agencies to build on confidence of people is there. But now, you take somebody, for instance, from Medugri to Bayasa, or take somebody from uh, Bayasa to Sukutu, you have challenges of language, ethnic differences, religious biases, and building confidence. People are not confident. I, okay, I'll give you another example. 
most of the people operating in the southeast, most of the policemen operating in the southeast, the general belief is that they are to make money, that they even buy their postings to go to that place. So they don't have confidence of the people. We need to restructure our security, rejig our security architecture to yield results. As we operate now, we don't have, we have problems of uh, equipment, we have problems of understaffing, and the states should be involved. If you recall that most states now, most state governments, even take their security in their hands, you know, by providing vehicles for the security agencies. So we need, in summary, we need to restructure our security architecture okay. for us to um, get results. Oh, okay. uh, he did say that um, um, our side seems to be underfunded, among other issues that we have. And uh, we also hear that approximately 240 billion naira is spent as security vote every year without transparency. Would this money have helped us in any way in this fight to equip these people who are in the forefront of protecting our lives? I think that we're now delving a bit into a political discourse. <laughs> uh, first of so, all... The matter of security vote is a political one. To some extent. To some extent. First of all, security is not cheap. Very expensive. Um, number two, I do agree with the retention of the security vote under some cloak of secrecy because there are certain things, like uh, Mr. Jeffers said, you don't bring to the fore. Now, it becomes very dicey. You want transparency and you want security. It has to be properly managed, which is why in advanced country, um, take for instance the American Senate Committee on Intelligence would have everything on mask before them so that you can then enshrine the principles of secrecy and then you deal with the issue of security. That's why even government documents are also classified. Um, now, that 240 billion, as purported, is an aggregation of the annual security vote spent across the 36 state plus the FCT mm -hmm. by the executive and by the presidency. So, uh, when you convert that to dollars, you're probably not spending so much because we also have to import equipment from outside. So, I, I do think that. 670 million dollars. Thereabouts. Approximately. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, we just talked about purchasing 20 Super A5 Tokano jets. Uh, the military needs several MiG, um, MiG uh, maybe Mi-35 helicopter gunships, which they are not getting. Um, I hear just now that um, the military and the Air Force have signed a new pact to now jointly collaborate better to address the issues of insecurity. And they are saying in the next 90 days, the issues of insecurity will be addressed. And I was laughing. That's not going anywhere. The landmass you have to cover. You have aerial surveillance drones that can't stay up more than two hours, four hours. More, more they have to come back to base. Some of them don't have night vision capability. Even if they have, the space they have to cover is too big for the paucity of equipment that they have. So no, sir, I don't agree. In 90 days, we will come back full circle again. The issues of insecurity will continue. Mm. As long as we continue the present setup, we are not going anywhere. Okay, so um, yes, some governors are beginning to say, okay, I don't need the security votes to the extent to which I've been allotted. We we'll use some to give back to the community. I think um, Rocha Sokroja was said to have been spent out of security votes. Um, Governor Shea Maki, they said to have been if you look at the case of Ogun State, the man had an armory. The past governor of Ogun State had an armory where he had over 1,000 AK-47 rifles in the state armory. Then the issue of end-user certificate became a bit of a turning issue in our national discourse. Uh, uh, to some extent, yes. But if you look at states like Lagos State, Anambra State, River State, almost every state in federation, if the states are not funding the police, the Nigerian police as cities today would collapse and not be able to serve the people. So I'm not holding brief for anybody, but I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Ijofo that clearly the 1960 setup, in fact, as of 1960, we had a decentralized um, security structure. It was after the coups and um, checkered history of the military 
that we now went into a full unitary system of government, which is almost what we're still running. I don't think we're fully a federal republic yet mm. because the states can make laws, they can adjudicate these laws, but they cannot enforce laws. So even in terms of structuring, we have a defective structure in this country. In this 2020, we are over 200 million people. The diversity is, is not what it used to be before. There is desertification um, affecting the Northeast. Before the insurgency, the Northeast had the largest cattle herding population anywhere in Africa. But those herders have to move. So they've moved down towards the South North Central. You're not seeing flare ups, which is caused by two things desertification and insurgency. So there's a complete destabilization of some fundamental uh, decision making structures we relied on before, before Nigeria became what it is today. So things have to shift fundamentally for us to address some of these issues. And I, let me make a point. When, when, when people come out to maybe lampoon and lambast the military, I say this with every sense of duty. You don't have any right to. You can, you can face leadership and political leadership. People who put themselves every day in the firing line to defend fatherland and to protect the integrity of this country deserve our respect and our support. If people get the security they deserve. I think that our collective uh, conspiracy of silence on the issues of security are part of the reasons why we are where we are. For example, the 13 soldiers and three officers that lost their lives, those are Nigerians. They didn't deserve to die. Give the military man the fighting chance. His morale will be very high. Our soldiers are doing more by sheer will and grit and personal sacrifice than we can ever imagine. And so some of the gains we are seeing on the ground all comes down to the gallantry of our fighting men, not just because they are very well resourced. So I know there's positive fun in the budget. So that's why when the, Mr. Jofo talked about looking for local solutions, mm. we must all come down from our high horses and understand that every approach to security must be local. So let's come down and find, look, we can, we can talk, stay here, talk the whole day on the issue of security. In 2016, the president had a summit on security. Some of the communiques from that um, summit, how many of it has been implemented? We have a 2019 national security strategy that focuses on human security as a key pillar upon which national security will pivot. You can't deal with human security if you're not talking about um, employment opportunities, you're not talking about um, welfare of the people, health care. I mean, what's the unemployment rate in Nigeria now before COVID-19? So there are a number of issues, and these issues are fueling insecurity. Okay, so... Let, let, let me put this to you. Um, yes. This matter of the structure as it is. Yes. Um, so Ahmad Sambo says, changing the service chiefs is not our problem. Our problems are corruption, favoritism, religious bias, and promotion issues in the security in, uh, agencies of the country. It says, there are many security officers or agents that deserve promotion, but they don't get it because of one reason or the other. So yes. you find out that someone, you and I, graduated at the same class, yes. but I am at a certain level. You, you have gone like five levels because of where you, where you come from. Where you come from or where you worship. So that thing about merit is no longer as obvious as it used to be. Ahmed says that's a major problem, not changing of service chiefs. That and the fact that the funding you talked about, who handles this? Executive, legislature? Who? We won't leave here, we'll talk about the funding. But you see, what Ahmed talked about is some of the problems that we have. When it comes to funding, I mean, politics and politicians, again, have become, they become the problem. Take, for instance, the NDDC case and the Senate. The senators and the reps, House of Rep members, are the ones that draft the budget. They are to supervise the budget drafting process and even oversight implementation. But where, where the senators themselves become beneficiaries to some of those contracts, already Nigerians have been so short. Okay. Uh, we'll take a, a quick break. We'll come back, Mr. Gio, for that matter of issues within the structure, promotion, biases, favoritism, 
and funding. How do we resolve all of this? We'll do that when we come back from this break. Just stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We're still looking at this matter of security. Uh, now, Mr. Ejiofor, before, before we went on that break, I said when we come back, we'll look at the question of issues within the infrastructure, within the structure of not just the military this time, the police, the NCDC, the DSS, issues of favoritism, um, no promotion when you, when you deserve to get promoted, um, corruption. How are all of this affecting their workings and what can be done to resolve it? Well, the resolution of these uh, challenges we have put us is complex. Uh, i give you an example. You know, like you said in your intro, you join the service with one other person. It's promoted far and above yourself for obvious reasons, ethnic interest or religious biases. This was not very prevalent in the armed forces. Until recently, you see people, junior people retiring under very senior officers. This kills morale and professionalism. It's a very big challenge. You can see soldiers almost getting to the point of mutiny. So to solve this particular problem of welfare, promotion, I think everybody has talked about it. The National Assembly has spoken about it. The Governor's Forum has spoken about it. Civil society organizations calling for the removal of service chiefs. I am not uh, calling for the removal of service chiefs. But I believe that they, when there's a change, there will be a motion. There will be a movement. People are retiring, generals are retiring because the ones heading the services are still there. It kills moral and professionalism. Besides that, promotion is stagnated. And that is why you see younger officers or junior officers, soldiers, rising to the point of mutiny. So that issue must be addressed if we must get results on this issue. Then you talk of welfare. How do you explain that you now send soldiers to go and fight? They are not well equipped. Today, we hear that, especially from the spokespersons of the various uh, services, you see a lot of people, today you hear 900 insurgents have been killed. Tomorrow you hear what I, and I ask, how many are these people that you continue to kill 100, 300, 400 weekly, and yet we are not getting results? We need to change the leadership of the various agencies. I'll give you an example. When the SSS and the Inspector General, the leadership of SSS and the uh, police was changed, there is improvement in the operations. When you stay in a place, there's a, if, you have, if you permit me, there's a proverb in Benin that when a fly stays so much in the toilet, when you stay so much in the toilet, you see a fly with coat. You see big flies. So these people have stayed. We must appreciate what they have done. They have done their best, but the result is not showing. So we need to try new hands. The president needs to check that so that younger officers will come up with fresh ideas. Like I said before, we also need to check the welfare of the staff, payment of the allowances. You talk of security votes and uh, all the budgetary allocations. The question is, out of the budgetary allocations, how much, how many percentage is, what percentage is released for them? You know, it's difficult to deal with the security agencies in terms of a budgetary allocation and oversight because it's not like where you have a works and other ministries that you can pad and get, get to this place. The security agencies will definitely submit what they require. One, they will not get the necessary releases 
And beside that, they also have corruption in the leadership that people would divert funds meant for either staff welfare salaries. I can tell you on authority that most of the security services don't have money. Our military and security agencies, they don't have money for capital expenditure. They rely more on recurrent. So how do we expect to win such a war? In this? It's, a, it's, a, it's a problem. And then that is we, why we are looking at, you know, solutions. Decentralize the police. Decentralize the, the, the police in particular because they are in the forefront of maintenance of internal security. If you don't get that done, you continue to operate that, okay, look at, we have security challenges. And I've I beg your pardon, Mr. Ojiofo. Are you referring to state policing? Are you referring to state policing? Yeah, well, the Inspector General of Police has introduced uh, community policing, but it goes beyond that. Because who controls the community policing? It has no control. But if you bring state police, which has, have always been advocating, it brings uh, security closer to the people. You mobilize the people, and they have confidence in working with you. As it is now, we are not going to get any result. We need the center is too strong. Way IG will be here giving instruction to the commissioner of police. You look at the governor. You say you are the chief security officer of the state. You cannot take order from him. I was privileged at least to be uh, a, a state director in, a, in about eight states in this country. If you are not dancing to the whims and caprices of the chief executive, just forget it. You will never get cooperation from him. But if he is in charge, he has the power to fire and hire. But as it is now, is the, the, the command, the control is from the headquarters, and you continue to see changes, transfers of uh, uh, state uh, commissioners of police and others. And this does not occur well because it disrupts continuity and flow of operations. Oh, yeah, Kachi, oh, yeah, we have talked over several years, we have debated, we have looked at the pros and cons of state policing. Is it time for us to begin to actually look at that as a viable option? We have seen many states come up with their community policing outfits, but they have all seemed to, they're all very quiet. We haven't heard anything, we, are, or we haven't heard much from them since they, all the fanfare of setting them up and all that. So where, where, where are we in this? We, unfortunately, we are far behind where we should be. We are talking about issues that we should have dealt with, say, 20 years ago, and moved on to other issues of even community policy. Now we are trying to put the cat before the horse. Wanting to bring community policing, presently as constituted, will not achieve anything. The constable is not an employee of the federal government or the states. He is not paid. He would not be armed. He will have his uniform. He would be tasked to do what any citizen can do by the constitution, effect a civilian arrest and hand over to the police. So it's, it's, we're not going anywhere. So state put, by now we should have gone beyond. People talk and say in Nigeria, we are not matured enough, we are not this, we are not that. And I beg to ask a question. How is the current situation different under the federal government? How will it be any different from under the states? We will go to a process and mature in it. We can properly constitute a state police board. We have retired senior police officers who can come and set these things up. Lagos State has shown how last month can work. So it's doable. We shouldn't be having this conversation. The fact that we are having this conversation shows how far behind we are in these issues. Unfortunately, people are paying every day in this country with their lives. People die every day in this country, and we have become numb as a society. So the fact that people die People die needlessly. The amount of kidnapping, vehicle jacking, uh, kidnap for ransom, the farmer headers clashes. I saw the local government chairman of Zango Katav, who was talking on air. I mean, you could see in his old dominion, the guy was already very helpless. 
We all look to Abuja for security. Meanwhile, we can make security a campaign uh, matter with our state governors. Right now, the state governors will tell their handicaps. They then Zamfara state governor resigned as CSO of the state because he said, hey, look here, I don't have the control of the apparatus of state. The governor of Borneo, who said that he may ask for, I'm sure he was joking, may ask for the military to be pulled out so that they can send in hunters. This is not a matter for hunters. So, I mean, across the country... But it just points to the fact that how frustrated he is, he is he with the is, situation. He is frustrated. He is, if he is frustrated as a governor of resources, how frustrated are the battalion commanders at the front lines? What logistics support do they have? Now the army is now muting up an issue of a, a army invasion, which I think is something we should have done by now. The army should have its own air unit. It should have its own air unit. It should have its own surveillance unit. Every super camp should be set up with platforms that will give them eyes and ears beyond their camps. It is not a joke when we tell you that the army on routine patrol sometimes are flying blind because when they pull out from their bases, some people will inform the other side that these guys are moving. You can't see what's on the other side. So is it possible that there are saboteurs within the structure itself? We are talking about competence, not competence, we're talking about capability to protect. Where would the people align? Where would they fall to? Do they feel more confident that the government has the wherewithal to respond and to protect them? Now, by pulling back to super camps, we're saving equipment, yes. We're saving manpower. We're saving life, yes. But then that leaves with a lot of ungoverned spaces and then slows down the response time. The challenge now is when you want to respond, you need to go on those roads, which is why the military introduced uh, moving out on bikes and having to be able to at least meander around some of these traps they are faced with. So the issues for me, I think, maybe we're not going to get it until the next administration. I don't think we'll get it right. But some of us are beginning to propose that maybe we are right for a situation where we have a national security advisor who is not ex-service anything. Let's have now a renewed thinking, a policy first approach. So when the Navy is bringing up the idea, there's no bias. When the army is bringing up there, no bias. When the DSS is saying this is what we need, no bias. When the police is saying what, well, there's no bias. There's no traditional way of thinking. There's no constituency to fall back to. It's all let us come. That's why you're seeing this interagency rivalry. That the inconsistency in collaboration. Because at the peak of the person that brings the advice into the president, at that very peak, you know. Uh, some things are not the way it should be. So when the NSA said he has been charged, so where would he start from? The DSS has several operations running. The police has several operations running. The army has several operations running. Which one will he begin to review? How do we go from here? So what exactly does he want to do in three years' time? We can't solve Nigeria's security problem in the next five years. I dare say, no, we cannot. And if we continue like this, you know, uh, by 2030, I think we're estimated to outgrow the U.S. in population size. Then Nigeria is estimated to become 350 million. Just imagine when we are 350 million, what space do the farmers have to farm? What space do the herders have to herd? Mr. Giafo, um, mm. the way forward, I mean, low-hanging fruits, what can we do? Professor Monokai says, all hands must be on deck to check me the alien security lapses. He says, if we change the service chiefs without restructuring the security architecture of our policy, it's working and still going, it'll still be hopeless. Um, Ayatunde Richard says, Boko Haram is basically foot soldiers. Therefore, Nigeria's military should invest more in airstrikes as there is no terrain in the air that is difficult and inaccessible instead of wasting the lives of our foot soldiers. Um, Fester Akimbo says technology can help us improve our security tremendously. Our forests are not as thick as they are in many countries, but they are able to use technology to police their forests effectively. Mr. Dior, for low hanging fruit as we wind down, what would it be? We, we just have to restructure our security architecture for us to achieve results. 
we need the, 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 the president needs to look inwards, get bills, sponsor bills, executive bills to the National Assembly to enable us to have uh, the state police. As long as we continue to operate this central, centralized security architecture, we are not going to make results. I'll give you an example. You remember when uh, Amoteku was uh, set up? Within the first two weeks, as we speak, they've not started operating. But because of show of force with their vehicles and everything, crime tended to renew. And I hope and pray they will take the initiative to start full operations in the southwest. Because once they started, you saw that they, 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 they now migrated to Delta, Edo, and uh, the rest of the states. So every state must take responsibility. The argument that it will be abused by the state governors does not hold water. Because as we speak, the federal police, the Nigeria police, is also being abused by the executive at all levels. So but, but there must be gaps, there must be checks and balances to, uh, uh, to, to check the, whatever the state chief executive has done if uh, the state police is in operation. That's my submission. The way forward. <laughs> the way forward. Well, I think I agree with uh, Mr. Michael Joffo, but um, I just say that um, everybody should um, sit up and um, hold their belts very well. There's no quick fix. There's no quick fix. Um, we can only start to progress when we take back the approach to security down to the local communities, down back to the states, and then hope that we can find ingenious context-based uh, programs that can help us address some of the issues of security. But I would just say in closing that um, without um, economic prosperity and development, there can be no security. And without security, there can be no economic prosperity and development. So whoever, is, um, whoever wears the cap as governor or as um, CEC, he has his work cut out for him. Mm. Um, Professor Enekena, um, our population has outgrown the number of security per individual ratio approved by the UN. This has some agrarious long-term effect on how to cushion the near security anarchy coupled with Al-Qaeda now infiltrating in northern Nigeria. We must act fast now. So um, I'd just like to thank um, our guests. We had uh, Mr. Mike Ejiofo, a former director of the DSS, who joined us from our studio in Abuja, as well as Mr. Yekachia Dekoya, a security consultant. Thank you very much for Thank joining you, us this morning to look at these issues. Well, we hope that um, those who are supposed to take decisions on this are listening to you guys, because you are supposed to be the experts, and we hope that our situation will begin to improve very soon in our country, north, south, east, west. Uh, uh, insurgency, kidnappings, herder farmers, clashes, we hope that we'll begin to see a reduction, if not an end, to all of this. Thank you very much. Sunrise will be right back in just a moment with another interesting conversation. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We must hold on and be strong. No matter what happens, whatever is thrown at us, we have to stay strong. Now, earlier this week, students in exit classes across the country resumed, and religious worship centers have also been permitted to open. This comes after a week-on-week -week reduction in the number of COVID-19 cases, as well as more recoveries and fewer deaths. But we have been warned, the end is not yet in sight. And the second phase of the East lockdown has been extended by another four weeks. So, are we opening too early, too late, or just in time? Must we open at all? Do we really need this? Well, to help us answer some of these questions, we have in our Lagos studio, Mr. Ayodeji Onibogi, a development expert. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. We're still expecting Professor Titus Sibekwe, Professor 
of auto auto running uh, auto rhino laryngology auto rhino laryngology to join us in the course of <laughs> that this word segment. again that word again <laughs> oh, anyhow uh Mr. Nibogi, so that question i asked are we opening too early too late or just in time or must we open at all uh well um as a people I look at Nigeria. Do we have a personal blueprint? No. We follow when others. I say personal when I say personal as blueprint, a national as a country, blueprint. do we have our own blueprint? No. So the issue of opening or reopening, um, there's a need to reopen so that s students don't miss out the last term or probably a whole year, which is good for their own personal development. Then two, when the country was locked down, we did the lockdown because other countries were locking down and it was eminent that we locked down. Now, these countries are opening up. And I think that's why we are looking at it as in, oh, let's try and open up. Because as I speak, uh, the governor of um, New York just um, last night said America, at least New York, they can open, they can resume schools. Yeah. So it's only the modalities of opening schools that they are trying, they are discussing with the various um, institutions. And um, if you look at the world, world, the world at large, we have about 1.5 billion people that are in schools, both primary, secondary, and tertiary institutions. And are we saying that these people, they are going to waste a whole year? No. So what we should do in Nigeria, where technology, um, the functionalities of our technology differs. When I say differs, is as we are here now, we cannot link up with Abuja. So naturally, there are issues when it comes to technology. There are issues generally. So the government needs to look for a way whereby, if you want to still continue the online classes, at least for a while, because uh, opening but school. Let's look at let's look at this a little bit. There, so far. For the past four months or there about online classes, online worship services or on all religious side, they've been thriving, sort of. Are you saying that they haven't been, I mean you've experienced some of it. Okay, when I say they have they might have been thriving, but it is one sided. Let's look at um, not, um public schools. How do they cope with this technology? We all know that the people that are in the public schools more than 50% of them don't have access to the basic technology that we think would drive the online classes. So they need to go to school too. Mm. So that's why government needs to reconsider opening school in a, on a personal basis. But what government needs to do is uh, to find a way around ensuring the safety of the students. And, um, when I say, if I say social distance, are we going to now say a classroom where we have 40 students, we just have at least 20, probably some will come in the morning, others will come in the evening. That, there should be a modality around it so that there will be less um, contact right. Right. and there will be less pressure on both the staff and the students. All right, let, I understand Professor Titus Ibikwe, Professor of Otto Rhino Laryngology is ready now, and he joins us from Abuja. Prof, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so the schools and the religious centers have been given the approval to open, but Mr. Onikbogi is concerned about the, uh, in his words, do we have a localized, self-generated formula? or modus operandi for all of this? Or are we copying other nations? Are we opening too early or just in time? Well, um, the, the reality is that um, COVID-19 has come to stay with us, at least for the time being. It's a new normal, and um, there have been modifications of ways that people are living, including Nigerians you know, to be able to live and stay safe within this period. As we know, um, life and livelihoods are very important. So we can't lock ourselves in those perpetually. Um, that would even be calling for a greater problem. 
um, reopening of school is, um, I'll say it is timely, it's called for, um, but of course there are conditions which must be met and which has to be strictly followed to make sure that this is safe. Um, we know that um, we are talking of phased reopening here. Uh, that is to say those um, group of students, the classes that are pressured right now that have um, exams and uh, related um, exit tests to do that will ensure that um, their future is preserved towards progressing in life. Um, those are the focus right now, which makes a lot of sense because where there will be problem and indeed the countries that had problems are those who decided to throw their floodgates open, reopen schools at every level at the same time. So you will find it difficult to be able to handle such situation. But where there is phase, we're talking of only exit classes. And over time now, there has been series and chains of debates on how to ensure that safety and precautionary measures are um, adhered to. Um, it takes two to tango. So it is a collective responsibility. We are talking of safety of our students here, equally the safety of the teachers, the proprietors of the institutions, and of course, the parents and the larger societies are important. So when we all play our roles, uh, following the guidelines that have been clearly stipulated, it is safe to go ahead and contain um, this percentage uh, of students who will be utilizing the same facility Hitato meant for the entire students, entire populace. The same set of teachers Hitato meant for a designated number of students and will work out proportionally and ratio-wise and abide by the strict rules and regulations is going to work. Let's know. And the country is even thinking of possibly um, jump-starting international travels, which by everything I'm proposed is even more dangerous compared to what is happening. So once we're able to abide by these simple rules and regulations, um, I think our students will be safe to do their exams. The key Prof. word here is phase reopening. Okay. Professor Beko, but from before now, the, the, the periods we've seen the ease, the eased lockdown, we've seen market places where the issue of wearing masks is not, I mean, it's very few people are actually wearing masks. Even on the road, you see very few people wearing masks. Even though the government continues to announce and pass across information that wearing of masks and different states are adopting that you must wear your mask before you leave your house. But you still find a lot of people, at least six out of 10, without masks. And now you're saying schools and the religious centers should open. How about if he, um, how do you say, enforcement? Do we have what it takes to enforce? Remember, I said the conditions attached to this must be adhered to. And that's what we are talking about here. It's very unfortunate that um, our society, they're not abiding by the rules and regulations from what we are seeing. Um, that, as you rightly pointed out, you walk across the street to take some sampling, you see a lot of people just name the simple rules of physical distancing and um, the use of their face masks. However, life must continue, and that means that we need to do more, even in propagating the message down to how we are doing our enlightenment program, so that people will get convinced that this is real, all right? But um, for our schools, there is pressure on ground right now, and there is absolute need for these students to write their exit exams, you know, and um, looking at taking a very close look at the guidelines that have been stipulated on ground under which these schools will reopen. If we abide by these guidelines in our schools, our students will be safe. That is exactly what I am saying. You saw the uh, clip of the minister, when the minister of education, when he visited um, a particular school, I don't know, maybe in Abuja, I don't know. And also um, the mosque, so some, some mosques yesterday, 
and how temperature was being taken before people were allowed in. They all had their face masks and there was social distancing. Um, if you saw those clips, how impressed are you with what you saw to the extent that uh, people are actually going to adhere to the guidelines given? Yeah, this this is a hard this is a hard not to crack really. Um, but if you take a look at um, as I said, what is going on around us, you'll start casting doubts and having doubts. But let's not forget, as I said, that today as we are speaking, there are interstate travels. That if strictly speaking, you look at even the rise in cases and the incidents, one will be tempted to say even lockdown should continue. Interstate movements should still be restricted, all right? And everybody should be indoors. But we know that this is not feasible. Uh, as much as possible, this is a disease of nature and nurture. And there must be a balance between these two. And um, that is the essence of making these visits and picking out holes and ensuring that these things are corrected even before the students come back. And it is also instinctive to note that there are some clips that also show that are very, very cheering, you know, on your channel here, of what is happening in Taraba and some other schools, how, strictly speaking, um, these uh, stipulated guidelines have been obeyed and um, strictly done. And I said, even in an earlier program um, here, that the responsibilities should not be left to the perpetrators alone, um, the government should augment in any way that these schools are lacking to ensure that they have the basic facilities. But now there are things um, which is within our own powers to be able to make sure that it happens, even without government coming in here. Stuff like physical distancing, like using of face masks, which are the two most important um, steps in controlling this disease because you'll be able to protect source spread and you protect the environment when this too. And there are some good news also coming. At least we know that um, uh, he tattooed our thought earlier on, uh, those who are asymptomatic, they don't transmit this disease as rapid as we thought, which means that everybody in the school ensuring that this face mask is used will surely protect. And I've also suggested that certain age groups among the teachers may be excused from even these um, uh, revision classes that will be ongoing in the next 10 days or thereabout for their exams. Those who are very elderly, uh, who are approaching 60, will be excused. Then the rest of the teachers who are there can take up that responsibility. By doing that, you're also protecting the teachers. And everybody should be prone to the screening that has been done, not just the students alone, including the teachers, the workers, everybody. And if we utilize the entire facilities in the school, all the classrooms as they were, despite the fact that we have fewer students returning, we'll be able to have a very good spread. And if possible, in open places, we do this um, learning so that we have enough spacing and enough distancing, utilizing most of the teachers so that the teacher-students ratio will be very, very minimal. If we observe all this, and using so many centers, even during the exams, you know, it's going to help us. So it's just looking into the nitty gritties. We as parents, we have roles to play. Our students who are very, very, our children who are very enthusiastic to have this uh, exit exams written, having approaching now dimension return, they have responsibilities also. The same thing with the teachers and the proprietors of various institutions. So if, and government too, if we all play our role, then definitely we'll get it right. And um, the life will continue while we still keep on struggling to ensure that we overcome this disease as much as possible. Mr. Nwugi, let's look at uh, the churches now. Uh, the mosques reopened yesterday and uh, I was quite uh, pleased with what I saw on TV you know, some footage of some mosques, social distancing, all of them with their masks, somebody at the gate checking temperatures, you know. So the churches are going to reopen tomorrow. Now, um, how um, do
do, do you think that these guidelines are all going to be followed when churches reopen tomorrow? Uh, How confident are you that they will be? Well, um, most churches, if they have the capability and the capacity, they will get those the temperature of these and that. But there is something that is very eminent in church. In church, we sing. In church, you shout. So the issue of not in all churches, you don't no, shout. No, 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 no. When, when I say so, I'm just trying to tell you. You express yourself to <laughs> to praise God. That's what I'm saying. So the issue of opening. Or no opening because we, let's look at it. Let's get it right. The, why do we cover our? Why do we use face mask? Because I'm trying to prevent anything that's going to come out of me to get into you. But when I go to church, I need to sing. So definitely, you sing with your mask on. You sing with your mask. Okay. So let's do it that way. So if because we cannot sing with our the mask instruction, on, the directive to the churches or the religious centers is that. If first of all you must have sanitizers, you must provide sanitizers. You must provide hand washing equipment, okay. mm -hmm. temperature measuring equipment, measuring and anybody coming there must wear their mask. And throughout then they must, the service. Throughout for the one hour service. Yeah, because it must be that must be and then, some services are much longer. And some, no, mm. they, no, there's a one, the, one hour. One hour. If you want to do fifteen services. One, one hour per each. service. Then one and hour okay. exit. 30 minutes. Is it 30 minutes uh, to, exit? to exit? But that, now, if that be the case, the question that I was asking you, is it enforceable? Do you think it will be enforced? And that's why I'm telling you that uh, most things that we say, let's look at the practicality. The type of nose mask we all have in Nigeria, if I talk, I'm very sure that you might not be able to hear what I'm saying. Mm. They, are not, they are not audible. You understand? So that's why I now go to the extreme to say, when you go to church and you sing, how... God will hear you. Okay, God will hear you. <laughs> so let's do that way. But, that, but it now shows that all worship centers, both church and mosque, it is now the owners of the leader, the spiritual leader, to ensure that all these things are properly done. Because the police cannot be there. The police we have, they are already overwhelmed with other activities in the country. Mm. So who is going to enforce? So the person that will enforce must be the spiritual leader, which is the pastors or the imam. Mm -hmm. So this must be done. Mm -hmm. If not, the, the, the all government is planning could be, um, it might not work. So mm -hmm. we're going to encourage everybody because it affects both the Christians and the Muslim. We mm. need to rally around and ensure that in as much as church and mosque has been opened, we mm. don't increase the number of COVID-19 patients. In, you know, Alara Al talked about what she, the impression she got from what she saw. I saw some other ones too, where there wasn't much of social distancing. Some mosque visited yesterday. Um, again, would, do you think there's a likelihood that because they're not following these laid down protocols, this release might be rescinded? Uh, yes and no. Everything depends on um, the size of the mosque and the size of the church. And that's why it's, it's advisable to, for churches that everybody wants to come in at the same time, probably have to have canopy outside. Then for mosques that everybody wants to come to inside the mosque at the same time, probably they have canopy outside so that there will be limited people inside the mosque so as to create the social distance that is acceptable. Okay, but exactly. if there are limited people inside, but then the mm. bulk of them are outside, no social distancing, what no, happens? But we'll look at that. We'll, come, social distance. we'll go on a quick break and we'll come back and talk about that. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We're looking at the opening of religious centers and schools too early, too soon, or just in time. We have Mr. Onibu, uh, Mr. Onibogi here in Lagos, and we have Professor Ibekwe joining us from Abuja. Professor Ibekwe, let's look at the, this matter of the religious centers that have opened. I mean, the mosque opened yesterday. They had Jumat services across the country. And then the churches are opening up tomorrow for their services. Some of these centers opted not to resume 
any activity. Um, but when you hear or what you, from what you've seen yesterday from the Jumat services, what do you think will happen in the uh, church services? Well, um, you know, as it is, um, we Nigerians um, are claimed to be very religious set of people. And of course, we know that um, religion is part of the spiritual well-being, which is equally important in life. However, um, we have to be alive before um, we'll be able to worship. This is true. But at the same time, until a man gets challenged before you will know his real capacity, I don't think that the eight um, rules and regulations, the guidelines that are stipulated, are things that are so difficult to abide by. Um, if truly and sincerely uh, people consent, the religious leaders and the worshippers um, are very cautious to ensure that they abide by these rules. But of course, it is instinctive to say that any group that feels they won't be able to abide by these rules, strictly speaking, should opt out. And there should be surveillance in place um, by designated authorities to ensure that this is done. And um, any religious house that is found to be, you know, thwarting these laid down procedures uh, can simply be shut down. So if we we have some enforcement into this. I think that um, it, it may work, it may work, truly and sincerely speaking. Um, as Elia pointed out, given the number of congregations that some churches have and some mosques, you start wondering how they'll be able to do this. But of course, it's one third capacity of whatever worship center that we have been using and I stipulated by the guideline, we must not exceed this. And even the time limit, the contact time, which is one hour, and there must be a period of sanitization of the same worship center before and after each round of service. So if it is one hour each, and everybody comes with face masks, and we're able to maintain this um, physical distances of two, two meters, you know, uh, I think we'll be safe. But anything contrary to this is not going to work. So um, that's what I will say. But I will advise that um, each and every one of us should take this as a responsibility because it calls for discipline. And we're talking of is Nigerians that are involved who have been clamoring that they need this. You know, they need to do their normal worship, be in tune with their gods, which we can't deny anybody. It's their fundamental human rights. But at the same time, this must be done safely. And that's why these guidelines are in place. So if it is matched with surveillance and matched with determination by members of the congregation and indeed the various religious leaders, it is doable. And they have to modify a lot of activities that hitherto they used to carry out in their various worship centers to accommodate these time limits and also eliminate those practices that will bring about direct physical contact, just like the conventional, you know, um, uh, going around to have handshakes and um, to make peace. All those should be out. And any other thing that will bring about physical contact. But at the same time, I give kudos to those religious institutes that feel they won't be able to abide by this. Please, you opt out early enough to avoid um, uh, you know, making our situation worse. An alternative is still all there, which is unlike worship. Uh, for unlike in schools, where we're finding this difficult, given that um, the facilities for learning uh, has not been widely spread out, because ordinarily one would have been thinking of, would these exams and stuff like that be conducted virtually and online? But we know that majority of the students don't have access to this. So it takes two to tango once again. If, strictly speaking, we'll be disciplined and be able to abide by these rules and regulations, we'll play safe. Because these guidelines were thoroughly looked at by experts drawn from different fields, including medical fields, members of um, the COVID-19 committee, NCDC, had to come out of this and feel that it is safe if they are strictly applied.
Um, we, we, we saw in that uh, clip before you, uh, you came on, um, all those guidelines being adhered to, you know, hand washing um, uh, ports here and there and sanitizers and all that. It's all well and good in the urban centers, but do you see all this taking place in the rural areas, in churches in the rural areas? Yeah, that's a very good one. That calls to question. And that's why I said that surveillance is very important, you know, and that we also have to up our games when it comes to um, publicity and how we are transmitting this information. So if there is evaluation and re-evaluation of this system, um, that will determine if this has to continue because it can just be a one-stop car. It's something that has to be worked over time so that people don't even go to relax. Those we are seeing who are abiding by these rules now, will they be able to carry on with this over weeks to come? Time will tell. But let's do our own bit of the job, passing the right information, holding the religious leaders responsible because their followers very much believe in them. And they are the change agents who will be able to transmit this information in the language that their followers will understand, including in these rural areas that we are talking about. So if we do this, it is possible. But if that is not done, then it's not going to be a very good one for the country. Yeah. Mr. Nibugi, uh, first of all, Kimbo says, I am more concerned about opening churches because many church buildings don't have good ventilation and airflow. Yeah, not just not just churches, even mosques. What he's saying is right. Hmm. Even there are some churches in where they are situated, is already they are already choked. So all these are things that it is now the church leader or the spiritual leader or the mosque leader that must ensure for such church or such mosque, probably they get canopies outside. Because if the space you have in is too um, you cannot accommodate more people. So it's better you get tents outside. Or you get more, if not, there'll be, what we are trying to avoid, we, 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 we recreate it if we are not careful. Because it's not composite that you still go to worship centers if there'll be, there'll be, there'll be more issues. Because if, if churches are mosques, if they are, where, where they are still there already, is there a, a, there's a problem mm. with their size. And then such church or such mosque is not expected to open. And the guideline also encourages as many as can to have their services outside. Outside, yes. Because it's better for you to be in an open air arrangement than a closed circuit arrangement. So as to limit the spread. Yeah, and Prof, let me, let me bring this to you. What about churches that are air conditioned? Yeah, um, air conditioner is not good enough for what we're discussing here. Uh, evidence um, uh, that came in not quite long ago has shown that even in physical distancing, that air conditioned room um, become portal of transmission, of circulation of the viruses. We know that we talk of droplets here, uh, initially, uh, rather than aerosolization, which is airborne transmission. But now, airborne transmission is real, and even the uh, you know the dividing line between droplets and uh, aerosols is a very thin one uh, because the heavy particles, depending on the air current within an environment, the temperature and also the humidity can easily be converted to aerosol. So, air conditioner should be discouraged. We need a good ventilator, as my colleague over there said, a good ventilation. And um, outdoor activities remain the best. If you go to the indoors, keep all the ports of entries, windows and doors open to ensure that there is good cross ventilation. And of course, maintain safe distancing. That's why even if it takes to have seven rounds of worship within this period, to ensure that strictly speaking, these rules are you know, um, stop by, it is very important to do that. So 
those cozy air conditioned places to be discouraged for now as much as possible. Be open. So, um, uh, Festa says pastors must um, wear face masks when preaching. This is not a time for somersault and acrobatic preaching. <laughs> pastors, I can boy. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the question of um, taking personal responsibility also comes in here for those that are coming to the worship centers or even those going to schools for the parents that their children will be going to school and all of that. So like Lagos, for instance, recently said those in JSS3 can start classes on Monday because they have to write exams. their basic education certificate exam. So um, when you say per taking personal responsibility here, what would you advise? For those going to the church tomorrow, those going to school Monday, Monday and all? Uh, we need to take personal responsibility. Um, as a citizen, what is expected is, let's limit the transmission. And how you can limit it is to ensure that you play your own part. And how you can play your own part is ensure that you wear your face mask, you do, you do the proper... Uh, social distancing, and then uh, the issue of going to school and playing, gesticulating, you should be limited for now. Um, students should ensure that their focus is just school, exams, and then they go back. Then, as time unfolds, other things can happen, but for now, this limits, students should limit the, the, the contact they have with one another because it's, more, it's very important. And they should and try as much as possible to protect themselves with their mask and then to ensure that they, 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 they do the, the, the hand wash must be something that is constant so that they limit the transfer and they try to prevent themselves. You can, is that you, you can affect someone or someone affect you. Mm. So it's better you protect yourself. You know, what I'm, I'm just thinking teenagers who haven't seen themselves in four months and then suddenly they see themselves and you tell them to <laughs> limit <laughs> no hugging, no handshake. I'm just imagining how difficult that will be for the teachers and the school authorities to monitor that. Let me take it to Prof. Prof, how do you think they're going to be able to cope with all of that? Yeah, um, well, you know, the nucleus of um, a nation means the family. And that's why we parents, as I highlighted earlier, we have key responsibilities to play here um, by ensuring that first we educate our children properly at home. Um, everybody has seen the ravaging effect of COVID-19, not only in Nigeria, but across the world. So it's real. You know, when you... Um, cancel these children very well and good enough. For instance, the exit classes, these are the older children, like um, you talk of this, those SS3. These are adolescents who are turning into adults. Uh, JS3 is where I have some little bit of issues, but with good counseling, good teaching, our children will tend to listen to us as their parents much more. So you educate them well, equip them well before they leave home. I have advised earlier on that you have um, homemade face mask of about five in number. Inscribe the name of your child boldly on this so that the idea of mistakenly misplacing or exchanging this will not happen. One per day during these five days in a week. Is washed, kept iron, one per day. This is done and strictly done. And when the children they're given this instruction, don't think that our children are not intelligent. They are, depending on how we transmit and pass information to them. So if they come to realize this and they get there, with the help of the teachers and help of everyone, um, they should be able to, you know, abide by this because. This is a new normal, it's a new life, which each and every challenges, which each and every one of us we must find a way of surmounting, you know. But the challenges are very big, they're very much there. But definitely life must continue as much as possible. 
Um, if we ensure that things are in place, we can do it. We are Nigerians and we have faced greater troubles in the past, including the Ebola disease, uh, with the right information, the right thinking, and the right determination, we can. Um, Mr. Nibogi, um this person, Identity 219, or Identify 219, says that he prayed at the Eco Central Mosque, Idumota. And um, he says that there were more people praying outside the mosque than those inside, and there was no social distancing. That question of self taking responsibility. Again, in, in closing, what would be your advice to everyone out there? My advice to Nigerian is, let's all play our parts. And what is your part? Let's follow the rules and regulation as laid down by the government. Because the rules and regulation laid down by government is not for the interest of the government, but it's for the interest of individuals. If you, are, if you play safe, you enjoy safety. Mm -hmm. So we, as individuals, either we are students or we are members of a church or a mosque, we must act our parts. And that's the best thing. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayadeji Onigbogi, a development expert. And uh, Professor Titus Ibekwe, a professor of otorhinolaryngology, joined us from Abuja. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts with us today. So nice we'll be back in a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Now we have a shout. And it's coming from um, the indigenes of some indigenes of Idimujewuko, a community under threat of security in Delta State. For five years now, the town has been facing insecurity challenges arising from the alleged activities of a member of the community, who they say has forcefully seized people's farmlands for his private business. Those who dare to question him are said to have been arrested and incarcerated on trumped-up charges and also on investigated charges some incarcerated for up to two or three years. We have in the studio engineer Igwe Enoyibo. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we also have Chuks Nwoko. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And Uche Aligbe, all indigenes of Idimuje Nwoko. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, now, let me begin with uh, Mr. Nwoyibo. What seems to be the problem? Yeah, good morning. Thanks so much for inviting us. Uh, for the past five years, we've had almost an untractable problem in our community where someone is using too much might, exploit, intimidate, incarcerate people, all because he wants some properties. About five years, about eight years ago, the community generously gave out 33 acres of land. Free. 33 acres of land is 33 football fields. An acre of land is a football field. Idimuju Woko is not a village then. It's, if you can give one person 33 well, acres, it's a big town. Looking so at me, you should know I didn't come from a village. <laughs> so I call it a town. I apologize. Thanks so much. <laughs> so 33 acres of land, one acre of land is six and a half plots. 33 acres of land is 220 plots. The town gave it to him to develop at no cost. And he has been developing. Along the line, he requested for 92 hectares of land. 
92 hectares of land. One hectare of land is two and a half acres. I hope you get me. And that's about 250 football fields. And that is equivalent to 1,000, almost 1,500 plots. That is the bareness of it. And the community doesn't have it. It, 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 it belongs to people. And unfortunately, it's either I have it or nothing happens. So we've been under a lot of threat. We've been under a lot of intimidation that people like us are not locked up is by God's grace. As of two days ago on the 6th, some of our men, innocent men, are in Kujay prison, one year anniversary, for terrorism and murder. They know nothing about. In Agua prison, two of our men, since 2017, are in Agua prison, June, for terrorism and murder. And if you know terrorism and murder is a capital offense. <clears throat> it's a capital offense that involves the government. And that is where we are. We are being intimidated almost on a daily basis. Our OB, who is a graduate, almost 70 year old, is perpetually in hiding. Perpetually in hiding, as I'm talking to you. An entire OB yes. is in hiding. Yes. yes. Perpetually in hiding. He cannot move. And we now felt it's gotten to a stage where, as responsible citizens of this country, let other people hear us. Okay. But by the way, the person being spoken about is Honorable Ned Mwoko. And the traditional ruler in question is Obi Chukunonso Mwoko. Are there relations? Yes, yes. And the man there is Chuk's Mwoko. Well, we have Chuk's Mwoko here. Is Ned Mwoko your relation? Oh, by the way, Ned Mwoko, you do have a, you, you will have your time to come and respond to all these allegations whenever you choose. Is it's he really, a relation a, of yours? It's a relation of mine. Um, and you are here to complain about him? Yes. Did you try settling amongst, is a family matter? Oh, oh, absolutely. Because, um, thank you for saying that. Family is everything. In 1983, when he finished his training school, uh, training teacher's education at Kadolo College, he was still young and vibrant and all that. He needed further education. He came to my house at number 32 Awoyoku Street to come and seek for help. My, because I was not ready to go abroad, my elder brother said, okay, what is the problem? He said he wants to go to University of Kell to go and study law. What came out of the mouth of my elder brother is that, oh, that would be nice. We had only one prominent lawyer at the time, Lawyer Mulu, a prominent lawyer. Judge Mulu later became a judge and all that. That would be nice to have you go study law after you troops will come. Before that time, Uzo Jebusa had gone. This young man really wasn't educated. He didn't have opportunity. Poverty did not allow him to go to university. But he saw potentials in Ned. So he sent him abroad in 1983. His, parents, his father couldn't send him, his mother couldn't send him. This man, we're a large family, because family meant everything. Family is everything, so he went. It's related to me. We lived together in one room. In, uh, I was in the same room with him. At number 32, away up the street in Pangrove here. So it's related to me. His mother is a princess of the Mokos. His mother, Ned's mother, Honorable Ned Mokos' mother, is a princess from the royal family. So we are related. So. He went to London and came back and became a billionaire and asked for land. They gave him land, 33 hectares of land. Acres. And the premise was that he was going to build a dairy farm. He was going to do a fishing farm, chicken, pigry, and all this. For the so benefit they gave him, of the community. For the, for the benefit, so they gave him massive expansion. I mean, he, he's a builder, so he, can, he described what they gave to him. Five years ago, it, with, and I, he, he, he has not been able to use, use up that 33 hectares. He didn't build a the dairy farm, he didn't build the fish farm, nothing. He just erected this massive, you know, house there where people come to visit him. Five years ago, he turned around to come and ask for if another 90-something, 90 92 hectares or 95 hectares from a, 
a, an agricultural we are farmers. And we said, look, our population is increasing. The lambas is not increasing. Only you, we gave you 33 hectares. You have not given an account of what you've been given. You turn around to come and ask for another 35 and all that. Anyway, we have a land sharing committee. You go and meet them, submit your proposal. He submitted, and the committee said no. So they presented it to the OB, to the uh, Crown Prince, and the man said, look, the committee says no, and we don't have this land to give to you. And that's the cross of the matter. So it's been, the major word is the intimidation and the bullying that is bullying us, using the police to raid the town, arrest people, charge them on trouble charges, and without investigation. And I have had cause to uh, be somewhere on social media where I have cried out to say, look, Buhari, uh, President Buhari in 2019, June 12th, uh, he said that fellow Nigerians, the government will not tolerate actions by any individual or groups of individuals who seek to attack our way of life or those who seek to corruptly enrich themselves at the expense of the rest of us. We will crack down on those who incite ordinary citizens, who, who incite ordinary citizens to violence and unrest. We will ensure that such actions are, not, are met with strong arm of the law. That was in 2019. If you remember the day he named the National Stadium in Abuja after Abiola, that's the last paragraph of that speech. Now, I have gone to social media to address the president. Look, I know you have too many things on your plate. But these troublemakers might not be known to you. Ned should be known to you. I'm calling his name. He's related to me. We tried to settle this thing within the family. It hasn't worked. Within the town, it hasn't worked. At the state level, the traditional heads in the place have tried their best. But this man won't listen to me. So gone, he's related to me. Have you gone to court? Yes. Yes. We have court cases. He has, he has so many court cases that he has instructed. In fact, he has abused the court process so much so that a particular lawyer has been... Punished. He's a lawyer, isn't he? He's a lawyer. No, he, he's a law graduate. He cannot practice law here. Oh, he did not overseas, go to law school. He did not go to law school. Okay. But I think overseas, he was a lawyer. Well, his kind of law, really, is, even while he was practicing, the history of his practice of law is there for you to investigate. Here, he's used, doing the same thing, but in a different way. Just abusing the court process, using lawyers, and all kinds of things that he's doing, lying and oh. all that. And, and thank you for extending that invitation to him. But I would also like to be here with him. I haven't <laughs> seen him in a long time. No, because he's not here with you, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Alibe. Um, how is it that he's also able to intimidate the traditional ruler of the city, um, of the town? That is the problem. Thank you very much for also having me here. The first is, you can only intimidate me if you have an assistance somewhere. Otherwise, man to man, no. He cannot intimidate the traditional ruler because that is a full-fledged man who has made his mark everywhere. Okay? But when you now have behind you the police force virtually at your beck and call, you can do anything. Are you sure he has a police force behind him? Can, so can I say a few things then? First of all, we are talking of land. This man like uh, you've been told, was given the one he was given. Even though we said no, dairy farm, you are giving him this, he's not likely to do this because our climatic condition is such that it cannot be done. Okay, but you know, the euphoria of, oh, our son in the house of reps and so on, let's give it to him, so to say. They gave it to him 15 years after nothing except a residential house in the place, and then you come in again and you ask for, well, they just played it down. He asked for 90 hectares to do a golf course in the village. Then he turned around and put in another letter asking for two kilometers by one kilometer size of land because he says he wants to develop a university. He's asking for all of them free of charge. He put in this letter on the the second letter came in on the 23rd of March. By 28th of March, 2015, I am saying five days after, he pulled in bulldozers, supported or protected by people in police uniform and police paraphernalia. What I mean is police van, police gun, and then in uniform. Maybe they're not policemen, but for us, we can't tell the difference. You, hear, you see what I'm talking about? They supervise the bulldozing. 
which continues up till tomorrow. The only young man who was bold enough to go in there into his farm to say, what are you people doing? It was the same police that arrested him, took him and charged him for what? Attempted murder. A golf course. Yes. Surely it will bring fame to your community. Yes. Because golf players are supposed to be big people and they'll be coming to play with him and spending money in your, in your town. It is not so. so I, can, I say, can I say this? I don't want to look at... To help the economy no, of the town to move at, on. Yes, I don't want to look at yes or no of a golf course in Idumu Juboko. There is one in Asaba. We want to know how much is doing. There's, There's one even Africa. one in Ogara. We want to know how much is doing. Look, you are talking golf players are people who go to where there is peace. Who go to where there is affluence. There is no peace. Delta, as a whole, you know that. Even if there was, they don't think there is. You have nothing to keep any golfer. The first 200 golfers in this world are all whites. Even the black one that is inside there says he's a white. You know that. But let's leave that alone. Even if you were going to do that, are you going to do that on the grave of those who own land, who earn their living from those pieces of land? because you want the town to say it has a golf course, therefore everybody else will die. I mean, it does not make sense. It does not make sense. And I kept asking him, where are you going to get this land? Because we don't have it. That's it. Talking about how is he using the police, I told you the first thing. The second is that they talked about cases. Cases. How can the police come in because somebody has sent in a petition, listed names, and when they list, even if it's 30 names, they put below it others. So that from time to time, they can accommodate more names. And they just raid the place and arrest them without investigation, without anything. And we're asking, how is he using the police? The police is surely behind him. Which time we have a problem and you go to report to the police, somebody will say, let's wait. The young ones, the youth, when they go there to report, this is happening in the community, they check. Ah. This man's name is on the list. You who have come to, be, to report will be remanded for a different petition. That is what he's doing with the police. And a lot more. And that is why we can say that even a natural ruler is in hiding because the police is after him everywhere. Mm. Okay, um, we'll, we'll go on a quick break. We'll come back to continue this conversation. Do stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We're still on to that topic, the shout from Idumije Uboko. The indigents are here to talk about some things that are threatening their lives there. Um, Mr. Aligbe, you were talking about some things. Let's look at the process of um, issuing the land um, as engineer Enuobi, Enuibo to, uh, mentioned earlier. He talked about 33 acres of land given, and now he's asking for 92. What's yes. the hectares? What's the process of giving land to an indigent of the, of the soil who wants to develop? Thank you very much. Let's uh, go. I'm saying this because sometime I was a president general of the union, and the union is supposed to be superintending the allocation of land in that part of the town, because we call it development land. That's one. Second, I can also tell you because I've had the opportunity of applying and going through the process of land allocation. So what I tell you, I have documents to also show in case you need. What you do is, you want land, you apply. First of all, we said that area was supposed to be for just projects, development. And therefore, what you required at that point in time was that you applied for land, you talked about the posture, the kind of parcel of land you needed, you told us what you wanted to do with it, you showed us evidence in terms of feasibility report and so on for us to study and know that this is genuine. Okay? Then we will discuss it. Do we have it? Yes, we have it. So let's give it. At that time, we were giving it free, but on condition that three years, that's what you have to get on developing. If you don't, it reverts 
to the community. To the community. That's laid down. Now, 33 hectares, well, they say, they say that it acres. acres. I can tell you it is hectares, uh, 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 hectares. He applied the community, gave it, even without the union knowing. They said he was going to do a dairy farm. And when the union got to know about it, I was president general then. I went to them and I said, hey, wait a minute. What is this portion of land for? Because people had applied in the past and we said, this thing you are asking for is too much. We are going to eat into farmer's land. And they said, look, it's for this. And we said, no, we didn't get any feasibility on it. We don't know about it. In any case, because I did agri, I can tell that you can't do a modern dairy here. Irrespective of the fact that there is a professor of agriculture in the royal family there. And we said, no, we don't accept. We argued it in an open meeting, and it was obvious that it was an error. But the obedience said to me, please, we have done it, we have done it. He has three years to do this. If he doesn't do it, it will revert. Since you say he cannot do it there, let's believe he cannot do it. After that, he comes back. And I tell you that for 15 years, he did nothing. OK? How to get it back? I don't want to get into that because it will become a little messier. Now, 2015, he applied for this. First of all, he wrote for 90 hectares. He wanted to join to his 33 to do a golf course. 16th of March, 2015. A week later, he threw in another one, asking for this two kilometer by one kilometer land. He wants to develop a university. Uh -uh. Five days after, Without even getting a response, you started bulldozing people's land, supported by uh, armed uh, people. That is it. So the process is, I have evidence here to show you the process. You apply to the land allocation committee. The land allocation committee looks at it, invites the union, they look at your project, and then when they are sure that this will fly, and it's OK, and everything is right, they introduce it to the general meeting of the town, which we call Izuani. They discuss it there, and they get everybody's buy-in. In the Izuani, the chairman is the natural ruler, the traditional ruler. So he hears, he listens, he watches people discuss these things. He gets to know what they are saying. Having said yes at the Izuani, then they are ready to go the application letter. That's what comes to the natural ruler, and he approves of it on the application letter, and then directs an organ that goes to map out the land. You go and map out this portion of land for this person. What we did after was that to make it less difficult for this community, this uh, community that goes to map out empty land, we surveyed it. I have a copy of the survey of the place. Again, we did that because we had now decided that this portion of land, just without development, let it go for residential accommodation. So we don't need to go and ask you to bring a feasibility study to know what kind of house. That was after the 2015, after the 2033 hectares. So it surveyed, it has everything. Once the OB approves, give this man a plot. Give this man two plots. Give this man three plots. The land allocation committee that looked at it will go in and say, this is your plot from this pillar to that pillar. Full stop. But what has happened now is that he threw in this application. God knows where he got it from. Before you knew what was happening, like I said, he started bulldozing land. Somewhere he threw up a letter, which if we discuss it here, you will see the lots of illegality and inconsistency in it, and said it was a letter signed by a, a traditional ruler allocating land to him. Meanwhile, he says, the traditional ruler says, 50 hectares will be given to, will be invested in his golf course, and then for the university land, one village will give it to him free. This traditional ruler now, or his father no, before his father. him? Okay. Okay, one village will give it to him free. After we finished the survey, Every plot of there, 
attracted some cost. I tell you, we were talking about the real icon we have in the town, Gabriel Obichia, who runs rain oil, the river of the moment, who just launched his uh, liquefied uh, petroleum gas here. When he asked for plot of land to build a filling station, he was given six plots. He paid two million for it. When he asked for plot of land to build his own private house, he was given four plots for somewhere and he paid for it. Okay. Even when he said that this was too small, we told him that was all we had. He had okay. to go and buy land okay. from a neighboring town because okay. he wanted to establish... Um, okay, um, we're, we're fast London running out of time. So, Mr. Noibo, why exactly have you come today yeah, to okay. shout out? Thanks. We came in to let Nigerians know what we are going through as a, con as a, as a town. We're under threat. We're exploited. Some of our men are in detention, as I'm talking to you now, in Kujie prison, in Agbo prison, for trumped up phantom charges of terrorism and murder. I want people to hear us, because somebody just does not want to make peace in the community, to allow our Obi to live in peace and reign in peace. As we're talking now, there's so much fear. The youths, the women, are in fear. And uh, even the press, we want the press to be bold enough to investigate, not just pick something and publish. Idumu Juboko is five and a half, five and a half hours drive from Lagos or seven hours from Abuja. They are free to see people talk so that we can live in harmony and live in peace before the entire town goes into, uh, is it extinction or into war? Thank you. Mm. Earlier you talked about some people that were in jail. Yes. Said, have they been charged? Look, yes, some of them have been charged. Terrorism and murder, you know? <laughs> Very and the case is on. <laughs> yes, in Abuja. And they're on bail with 50 million Naira bail bond and a property in Abuja. For an offense in Delta, ask yourself, we don't want to go out, I'm not a lawyer, how did the case get to Abuja to tell you all the dirty things that are happening? As I'm talking to you, the guys are there. 50 million bail bond with a property in Abuja. Is it achievable? It is just to let them stay there almost permanently. And since 2017, Jen, uh, uh, January 17th. Uh, June, another two innocent human beings are in Agbo prison. In fact, it's, a, it's sad. When you say terrorism, murder, you are like, you are as, as if you are giving them a death warrant. Do you get it? It's not a bailable offense. Is the state governor aware of all this, Chooks? Yes. You say he's, yeah. I, I want to assume that he's aware of it. Um, I, I, I believe so because we have had occasions, if no more than once, the governor has been to the place to launch a Gabriel Obeche's uh, project. And um, you know, the governor and the current OB, they were schoolmates in Edo College those days and all that. And the so uh, the OB should, should be able to cry out to the governor? But we're crying out to you and the president and the governor and everybody. The truth of the matter is that. The system has been compromised by this billionaire, Honorable Ned. Um, the truth of the matter is that the Moko, the word, the name Moko, was the wealth that we inherited. Then we had peace. Then we had joy in our spirit. If we had ten thousand naira, it was enough for us. But this billionaire has come. And by the way, we're talking about being a billionaire, Ned. Um, he enjoyed the benevolence and the kindness of the Mokos, because before he became a billionaire, this is him when he was living in my house. This is him here. This is the night he was going to London. We were sending him to London. So he has not always been a billionaire. We sent him. The only education the mom could provide for him was the, at the NCE he acquired in a Kiadolo college. He was a teacher until we saw the potential in him. He has transformed that potential and that talent to this negative by destroying. Look, Obi Ajulu Moko, a 87-year man, a old man, just left the hospital because he, I arrested him. He took over his land 
asked his mobile policeman to throw his motorcycle inside the bush. And let's, let's not go that route. But this is a man who, who has enjoyed the benevolence and the kindness of the entire family. Now, we're not rich in terms of billions and properties and tennis court and all that, but the wealth that attracted my mom to that family was just the name. The name opened door. And you know about Dimas, Professor Dimas Moko. You know about Somaya Namoko, the first agro professor of agroeconomics, those in the University of Ibadan. Those are the kind of things that we have. Bright minds. Bright minds. So, but the question I expect that people will ask this man when it comes eventually, by the grace of God, is what do you do for a living? Now you're talking about crying out to the governor. He provides a political news out for them at the political party level, so nobody can talk to him. So we are crying to the president. Which camera can I look at and talk? Talk to us. Okay. <laughs> I am appealing to the president to come and help us. We are in trouble. Ned Moko is using the police to bully us. I have received calls from family members threatening me. My wife, my life means nothing and it's worthless if my people, like Obi Ajulu, a 87-year-old man, can be treated the way he was treated last week by Ned and his last cohorts. And, and, and Ejimofo, Prince Ejimofo, was arrested. President Buhari, I know you have so much on your plate, but come and bail us. Come and help you. We are part of your people. You, we vo I voted for you, and I keep supporting you and praying for you. The bandits in Kasina, you might not know, in, Ka in Kaduna, you might not know them. Ned Moko is known. I know his address. You can take him out. He's disturbing us. We need to enjoy peace and have joy. Maybe I will add on to why the governor. The governor is doing a lot <clears throat> that is capable of doing. But when you have a police force, and even in the state, they pretend, whether it's true or not, to be receiving instruction, instruction from above, they go beyond the governor. It's sometimes when the governor insists on certain things that they get done. Otherwise, for them to wake up a night, because somebody wrote a petition, I wrote a petition on you and said, you slapped one of my brothers. The police comes in in 15 vehicles, all armed at 2 a.m., to break down a palace, all the doors and everything, and arrest the traditional ruler of the place, put him in handcuffs. What you have not investigated, and you just take him. And then Three somebody's weeks. writing and telling them that, oh, he's been arrested. Even the commissioner opened his mouth somewhere to say, yes, we arrested a self-styled traditional ruler. His deputy commissioner, when he did a job there, referred to him as crown prince. I don't know what that means. A crown prince is the one who is next to the throne. And when the throne is vacant, it is for the crown prince. But this is what's going on. But let's leave that alone. Even the people were talking of um, uh, terrorism, terrorism. Can you imagine that even at the high level of the office of the Attorney General of the Federation, they can prepare a terrorism charge? for a complaint that a governor has not shouted about, not even a local government chairman has shouted about. I know what's going on between Jukun and uh, the thieves. We know what is going on in uh, Kaduna. We know what is going on everywhere. He has not proffered any terrorism against anybody. What you haven't had, you have not even investigated. You put cases that are already in court, here and there, you put them together and you target terrorism and you take it to Abuja and you expect peasant farmers to be moving from a village in Delta to go and attend court in Abuja. That, as far as I'm concerned, is moral injustice. But that is what's going on. The <laughs> governor cannot stop it at that level, no matter how much he tries. We know he knows. He is trying his best, but these powers are sometimes beyond him. And that's why we are shouting to the man who has the power to say, hey, stop. And as we talk about the police, let me put this straight away. We want to exonerate the Inspector General of Police of all these. Because even as an AIG, he did his best to sort this thing out. And this young man, Ned Moko, refused to do a whole lot of things. Even as IG, most of the things going on, I'm not sure they get to him. We exonerate him every time of all these. What is happening is happening just a little below him. And that is the problem. It's um, just unthinkable that one man can do all this. Um, I'm not in Nigeria. Are you sure you all don't have a grouse against this man? 
Definitely no. Girls. <laughs> Definitely no. Girls. For real? Look, you need to see the community. It's a pity we have a TV thing. We don't need to bring in Uboko. If not, we can flood here the entire channels with our people. If I open my social, my phone, I won't use courses. But a lot of us, for people like us to step out our head, tells you how daunting this situation has gotten to. Do you get what I'm saying? I tell you, that, 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 that thing is grouse. Look, you cannot be a giver and lack. We are not rich people. We have never been, quote, billionaires in our place. But we're very rich. We go to in school. spirit. Our parents, look, people like him went to school and we saw them drive bicycle, ride bicycle to PPGS. We saw people go to St. Pius. That was what was given to us. And this man you're talking about needed education. They could not, he could not get education. But the family, Dan Moko, Omoni Moko, called him and said, Yeah, it looks like you are talented. What do you want to do? He said he wants to go and study law. And the man, I was in that meeting. Now, the issue here really is the issue of lack of integrity. If you know, just to reply to what grouse, look, where we come from, we are, we are contented people because we drive our wealth from hard work. Then we drive joy from relating and eating together. That's why that community has existed before this man. Before this man came into, became a billionaire, we have lived together. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. We lived together in harmony. And it's the same palace that, it, that has been vandalized. When we have communal issues, we go to the place to settle it. We have no police. We didn't have police station. The, maybe there was police station in our headquarters, uh, local government headquarters. But within that community, it is now modern day Nigeria that we now have police police post near us there. But we never used to have a police post. If I had issues with you, we were invited to the family meeting. If it was beyond the family, whatever, yes. we went to the palace. We lived in harmony. We went to each other's farm. We built houses for each other. We were, you know, go dig up red, whatever, match it, and we build for you. You build for me. We were, we're communal people. We lived in peace until the emergence of this greed and this self-centeredness and this pattern that has followed this man, pattern of bullying people to take their, their, their whatever. That's what we're dealing with. It's not grouch. Okay. Come on. The, the things that he said he wants to build, talked about the university, yeah. talked about the golf course. Yeah. These are things that will benefit your community. The motivation you sorry, don't know about it. We, we are not against development. At all, we appreciate, we welcome it. Go through due process. Exhaust the 33 acres you have. That is our ground. Exhaust it. Tell us and use what, it for the purpose tell us you what said. What else you need? I mean, don't get carried away. I'm an educated person. I'm an engineer. Exhaust the 33 acres you have. Tell us what you need extra to make up what you want. They are due processes, and he had been eloquent enough to tell you processes of, we are talking of process, we're not talking of acquisition. Nobody's against development. It's going to be a beauty. I have a home there. A lot of, all of us here have homes there. I mean, maybe my house will be the vice chancellor's place. Beautiful. But if you want it, why not go through a process? Must you take over a whole community, a whole town, just because you want a golf course? or you want uh, a university, no. We are not against development, please get that right. But we want this process to be somebody that you and I, we're going to leave. Our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren are going to be there. Let there be something, a legacy, a beauty, a system, a standard that is left for them. I want to end up somewhere by assuring you of this, I'm happy you have invited him, he will come. He will give you an impression that some group called Izuani gave him land. He will brandish some letter. Our natural ruler has never written to anybody. I give you this. He signs the process allocates land to you. How he manufactured that letter, which has a lot of inconsistencies, that is his own. But even that same natural ruler wrote three letters disowning that thing he was carrying around. One privately to him, which he signed for, before he now started telling the people, since he didn't want to adhere to what he said, Luko, I didn't give this man any land. The three letters are there, and it is because of it that he invited the police to start harassing 
the now natural ruler who was a crown prince then. That is where, where, where is he now? Where is the OB now? We, 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 because he's in hiding, we cannot tell where he is. <laughs> oh, okay, he's in hiding right this now. This is the truth of the matter. The wow. palace does not have the OB inside it. I mean, they came 1.32 a.m., raided it. You need the desecration. This, it has broke never into happened. The, this in, tear gassed yes. the whole place. Tear gassed the whole place. Then a week later, it's not a week. they came back. The next, they day. the next day, on a Sunday. They got, on uh, a Sunday. Sunday, they said they were looking for cops. They dug five pits in the compound looking for a burial. The desecration ground. of that um, that palace. Nobody it has never buries. happened anywhere in the world, in Yoruba land. Or, I don't know how these rich people. Have you heard that they went to their paternal grandfather's house, palace, to go and dig up whatever? They break into the palace. That's they, what Ned is done they in They dug all over. They didn't, see, they didn't see any single cops. Nobody, no. Meanwhile, we have pictures, broken down windows, doors, tear gas. I'm not telling you a story. I was in Asaba, handcuffed him. I'm not telling the you what OB, somebody told yes. me. And the, the I'm not telling body, you what somebody the dead told body me. They came to look for handcuffed on, him on the 19th of July. Sorry, it was my driver. It's part that of the bought his slippers charge. for him to a rubber slippers for him to wear. It it was that bad. I had to ask my driver. I had to ask the police. This is our OB. Aobi is almost so we've been, at, we've been assaulted. Graduated from Nsuka. I had he was an illustrious bear, career bear, in Lagos. Yeah. My driver had to go and buy rubber slippers for him to wear with handcuffs at Asaba. If at that day, if I told you I wept, I mean it's an understatement. We were so we couldn't believe it. But thank God he's a gentleman. He absorbed everything. You know how they move people. There was no dress. He just had his clothes and a t-shirt. Like, like a common criminal. Yes. yes. Handcuffed. And, and I told the, you, and the, I told the, the police. The, the dead bodies they came looking for on the 19th of July. That is the charge. The people who have been in incarceration since 2017. That is the charge they're facing. Somebody was killed. Who is this person? Where is it? Uh, where is the body? What happened to him? Let's even see. Let's know that somebody died. Let's know what killed him. Let's know who killed him. For three years. Once they get a holding charge and the people are in there, then investigation can take forever. Just to keep people. I mean, and that's a As we are sitting here, they have so many spurious charges against various people. We can even be living here and you hear that... Uh, the police has uh, rounded three people up, and then they're taking them to Abuja because there's a petition saying that whatever. And nobody's asking questions. You report, nothing happens. I mean, that's the problem. In that's case, the folly of the community now. In case they bring you, attach you to me for interviewing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's the law that we We are also at risk. So, we are, I'm just warning that's you. A law I'm just warning you. That's a version of law that we that Omonye, Omonye paid for to send him to go and no. study law so that the community will be blessed. It would be nice to have it. That's a version of law that he went to study from. So Sam Wasborn says, so sad watching this interview. The police is supposed to be on the side of the law. The collective will of the community should be greater than the will of one individual. Um, well, future governor says, where is the evidence or videos to back the demolitions? Okay. I, I am sure yeah, that, internet. I am yeah. sure they have them. In fact, they say they're on the internet. Please, who is terrorizing that community? <laughs> this is from Adams Dean. Who is terrorizing, the, well, they've been shouting his name all day. Honorable Ned Moko. Using proxy. <sighs> well then. Mm. Well, we just wish you all the my, best my younger sister in this called year. Me the time, in case if I get arrested when I leave here, it's okay. My younger sister actually called me. She's been intimidated, but she's also on my matter that he's not going to go and beg Ned to release me by the time he lays his hand on me. So, but, but I'm here. I'll step out soon. So whatever he wants to do with me, no wahala, but we'll be nice to him. You know. Okay. Well. We we'll hope to, to get an able Ned to come and answer. Yes. Exactly. Like Come on, respond to all this that has been said against him. We, we, we will expect him to show up here and uh, 
tell us his own side of the story. And we wish the community of uh, Edimujo Boko all the best in sorting out this thorn in their flesh, this matter which they have brought to national um, television. Uh, I'd like to thank engineer Igwe Enoibo, uh, Mr. Uche Aligbe, and Mr. Chuks Moko, who happens to be a relation of the said Honorable Ned Moko. <laughs> all indigents <laughs> of Idimujo Woko, thank you all thank very you much us. to bring this to the consciousness of Nigerians. Sunrise will be right back with the home stretch in just a moment. Please stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. Um, he's, they say he looks like Two-Face Idibia and sounds like him. Uh, but he's an award-winning singer, songwriter and performer. He has wowed many audiences around the world with his song, style and charm on stage from the Starquest Singing Competition in 2006 in Joss to the annual Kenny's Music Easter Fiesta where he astonished the crowd with a freestyling rap a cappella. Joel Amadi, known as Joel, is a sensational singer who hails from the northern part of Nigeria, born in Sokoto State, grew up in Kanu State with his family. Joel, welcome. Good morning. Wait, wait, you're Joel Amadi? Yes. And you hail from the northern states? Oh, yes. Uh, in the north, it's pronounced um, Amadi. 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 And other people call it Amadi. Uh, no, sorry, we call it Amadi. And then other, like the east and the west, call it Amadi. Okay, in the east, called Amadi. Yeah. Amadi. Okay. I see. So, Joel, um, <clears throat> what's it been like for you? I mean, you've heard this thing about you look like Two Face, sound like Two Face. Yeah. Yeah. And you've done some collabs with him recently. Yeah. Um, I mean, I later realized it's a blessing in disguise, you know, because uh, I always tell people Two-Face is a good name. Mm. You know, it's not a bad thing to be identified uh, with a good name. So um, I feel blessed about it, but I'm not dwelling on the fact that people say you look or sound like him. I'm also in the, biz uh, in the music industry to do what, you know, I've come to do and, and not get distracted by what people are saying. Mm. And how's it been for you? Well, so, so far so good. It's been good. So your, your tone between rap and Afrobeat, uh, have you decided which one you're going to focus on? Oh, of course, on? Afrobeat and R&B. Okay, Afrobeat yes. and R&B. Yes. How's that been? Yeah, like I said, business is not bad, so far so good. You call it business? Yeah, of course. I must make money too. <laughs> <laughs> is it just fame I will make? <laughs> okay, has... you've had collabs with quite a number of big names. Yeah. Um, talk to us about the one that you were most impressed with. Um, all of them. Um, I mean, Iyaya, Orisha Femi, Jay Martins, Fino, Olamide, Teriji, to mention a few. And then the one that actually broke, uh, you know, like, you know, gave me that big... I broke the bank. Yeah, that, exactly. Was the one I did with Two-Face, uh, two which is Hold On. Two-Face you know, Yeah, because of the story behind it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry for your loss. Thank um, you. you. tweeted something on the 25th of July about yeah. your dad. Yeah. How's that been? Oh wow, it's not been easy, you know, um, becoming, I'm, I'm a father now, I'm the only son. So yeah, I'm like the father of the family, the husband to my mom, and um, God has been, has been good, has been faithful. Um, I thought I was alone, but I didn't know God had uh, angels surrounding me all along. So since the death of my dad, I've been receiving um, genuine love from people, from the media, from my fans, from people who I haven't met before. You know, um, I know it's not easy, but I've, since the incident happened, I've been praying for God's wisdom and strength to carry on, uh, because right now the only option I have is to be strong and not to be weak, so yeah. Do, do you think, um, I know your dad was one of those that supported you in this, yeah. in this but did you study music? Uh, yeah, I was in the choir when I was much younger. Okay. Yeah, before I became a teenager. So I was in the choir from the age of 11. That's the only training in music you got? Oh, yes, yes. Ah. <laughs> Do you play any <laughs> instrument? Oh, yes, I was a drummer. You still play? I used the word, I was, play? because it's been a while I drummed, so. But I think I still have that, that skill, so. Yeah. So now you just do the vocals? Yeah, the vocals. Okay. Um, this is um, August. Christmas is coming. The year is coming to an end. What do we look forward to the rest of the year? Uh, you mean entertainment-wise? Yeah, coming from oh, you. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, the rest of the year, um, 
we look forward to um you know mm -hmm. having uh covid 19 being er eradicated so entertainment can go back to how it used to be before or probably better um not just entertainment the economy of uh, our country nigeria as well because a lot of things have been affected so we, we just pray and hope that this uh, coronavirus would leave us alone and let's get back to normal and, you know, start doing our doubles. <laughs> coronavirus. Well, as some will say, coronavirus has come to stay for a while, so mm -hmm. get used to it. But just before we go, um, if you had a word, what would you say to Nigerians out there, your fans and all? Uh, if I have a word right now that I would say to my fans out there is... Um, I won't tell you to go and download my music at this point because I feel a little bit heavy in my heart, um, knowing what's going on in the country, you know. So I want to encourage each and everyone to use your opportunity. If you're an artist, if you are a fan, uh, you also, as a fan, you have a base, you know. So use your, your platform to um, let the world know that, uh, as it is right now, we need some help you know, in our country, Nigeria. And then let's also try to talk directly to our, our, our politicians, you know, our leaders, to let them know that things are going bad. And let's see how we can together make things great for Nigeria. Joel Amadi, I, you do freestyle rap, so you do that in 10 seconds after we sign out. And we're okay. signing out now. Joel Amadi has been our artist of the week. Thank you for coming on Thank today. So and that's where we wrap up Sunrise for today. Thank you for being with us. We'll be with you again next week. See you then. And I'm now Taibe, thanking you again for letting us be a part of your morning. We leave you with Joel Amadi, who will do a quick freestyle rap. Joel, over to you. Okay, um, I have to say, just hold on and be strong. It won't be long, it's gonna be alright. Just hold on. And be strong, yeah. It won't be long, it's gonna be alright. Do good.